introductions. I'm Jimmy Parra. I'm a staff attorney at uh, Midwest Environmental Advocates. We're based out of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we're a public interest environmental law firm, and my um, my involvement with Frax and Money began about five or six years ago when I first started with Mid Midwest Environmental Advocates, and we started hearing uh, <coughs> from a lot of folks uh, with concerns about this new industry that was moving into the state. Um, and so we started meeting with diff uh, different community groups and community members, um, and, and we got and got more involved. And I'll during my presentation, I'll kind of uh, give an overview of some of the work that we've done over the years. But um, it's it, uh, so yeah, it's been about five years or so I've been working on this, which is not as long as a lot of other folks uh, that have been really at it day to day. So this is Tim. I'm Tim Jacobson, and I'm I'm somebody who wears a lot of hats. So um, I'm a, I'm a lawyer by training, and currently employed as such at a law firm uh, dealing with a lot of frac sand mining issues. Um, but I spent uh, a little more than seven years as executive director of the Mississippi Valley Conservancy, which is a nonprofit land trust working in nine counties in southwestern Wisconsin, which covers most of frac sand or a very significant amount of frac sand territory. Um, and so I, I was involved in doing private voluntary land conservation through the Conservancy. I also am a past board member and past board president of Midwest Environmental Advocates, which is the organization that Jimmy works for as, uh, as a staff attorney. So I was on the board, he's a staff member. Um, and so, you know, kind of I wear the legal hat, uh, the conservation hat from a couple different perspectives. and. Uh, we're just thrilled to have an opportunity to talk to you about how we can try to address this issue with our landscape. So I'll let Jimmy take it away. That was good. I'm gonna go over to this side. <coughs> uh, so if there's, you know, if there's a pretty small group here, so if we have questions along the way, feel free to um, just speak up. We can kind of we can have discussion whenever uh, it makes sense to. So you know, feel free to interject. Um, what I am planning on, on covering is just some of, um, from my own experience working with folks, what the challenges have been for communities in working with the government at both the state and the local level, and some of the, uh, just the challenges that uh, the communities have run into as they're trying to address the impacts of frac sand mining. Um, so I'll cover some of that, and then I'll also look at what uh, some of the different tools or different avenues that communities can use uh, in order to move past some of those roadblocks or move, move past some of those challenges. Um, there's, when I think about the sort of big box of uh, advocacy tools, like I'm, there's lots of different ways that communities can advocate their interests. Um, what I'll talk about today is a, a narrow sort of set of those and it's really working within those processes that the government has set out for the public uh, in order to address uh, the problems that they have. So there's, you know, there's direct action, there's working with the media, there is uh, litigation, and sort of what I'm going to focus on in my uh, presentation is, you know, public participation in government decision making, how you can challenge those uh, decisions that the government makes, and also. Um, different enforcement actions that you can take when the government fails to uh, uh, fails to take those enforcement actions themselves. Um, so that's kind of just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today and the angle I'll be coming at, at it from. Um, before I jump into frac sand mining, I just want to give uh, an explanation of Midwest Environmental Advocates and who we are. And the reason I want to do this is because I think it involves a really interesting piece of Wisconsin history that has a lot to do with how when government works and the public rights are protected, it's a really interesting example of you know, how that can happen. And we've gotten away from it, at least in Wisconsin, um, but I think it's worth just, just, just knowing that little interesting bit of Wisconsin history. Um, so in 1967, uh, and, and leading up to 1967, in Wisconsin we had both a resource development agency and a conservation agency, and there was a proposal in the legislature to merge those two, uh, those two agencies. And so there was uh, the public was very concerned that the 
resource development arm of that combined agency would have more of a voice and control over the conservation end of the agency. I thought there would be agency capture by industrial and <coughs> resource development interests. And so there was a lot of pushback against this proposal to combine the two agencies. The deal that was struck is that um, they combined the two agencies, but they created the Office of the Public Intervener, which was a, an independent uh, government office that was housed within the uh, Wisconsin Department of Justice. And it was charged with protecting the public's, uh, uh, the public's right in, excuse me, it's charged with the, um, protecting uh, the public's rights in the environment. So, any so they they did a couple of different things. They advocated uh, within the different agencies at the state level for the public's right in the environment, um, and they even brought they advocated in the legislature as well. And they also brought lawsuits against the state agencies if the state agencies were taking actions that. Uh, violated or you know, based on public rights in the environment. And so it's really kind of an interesting concept because it's a government office you know, funded by the state that actually went and sued other arms of the government when they weren't taking into account the you know, public's right to enjoy and use different environmental resources. Um, pretty, it was, as far as I know, I don't know if Tim knows any different, I think this is that's really kind of the only we're the, we were the only state that had a, an office like this. I don't know if there was public interveners in other states. I don't think I'm not was. aware of them. Yeah. I'm not sure. So it was a pretty unique office, but it was uh, really powerful. I mean, they, you know, you had the an office that was dedicated to protecting the public, public rights in the environment, um, and that was very effective in, uh, in doing so. Um, and then this is just a quote from a former president of Wisconsin Manufacturing and Commerce. So, WMCs are known now as a very, it's the largest um, association and lobbying group for manufacturing and commerce interests in Wisconsin. Um, back a few, several, uh, several years ago, um, the, the president of the WMC at the time had this to say about the public intervener's office, and I think he did a good job of sort of capturing the importance and the role of the public intervener's office in Wisconsin. Um, Unfortunately, in 1995, the state abolished the public intervener's office. Uh, and so at that point, our founder, Melissa Scanlon, um, wanted to restore that, that access to legal and technical services that the public had to the public intervener's office. And so she created uh, a nonprofit organization, independent, and wasn't associated with the state. Uh, and that's <coughs> our mission, sort of in a nutshell, is to um, to provide that legal and technical uh, support to community, <coughs> to the public as they're trying to protect their own rights in the environment. Um, and then this is our, uh, uh, one of our, our founding board president at MEA, and he was also on the, the public intervener board. Um, this is Arlen Christensen. And I just think it's a, it's a good quote. Um, and he says, environmental laws don't enforce themselves. Somebody has to step up and that somebody is us. And I think the you know, important thing to point out is when he says that somebody is us, he's not talking about MEA, Midwest Environmental Advocates, he's talking about you know, all of us in the, in the public and all, you know, who live in these communities and want to use these resources. There's a role for all of us uh, to protect the resources and there's ways that we can do that um, and it's important for us to step up. And so I'll go over some of those opportunities that we have um, to participate in these processes. But, it's just important to keep in mind because sometimes the government fails to do what we hope it will do. Sometimes. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so just as a little bit of background, as I know there's at least one of you who wasn't at earlier presentations that discussed um, what frac sand mining is and its link to hydraulic fracturing. fracturing. Uh, but this is, uh, Essentially what happens is in, in hydraulic fracturing, they drill um, an oil, and, like a dr drill down up to thousands of feet into the ground, uh, horizontally as well as we'll see here, then they, ex they drop down explosives <coughs> that create these cracks in the ground. And the sand, as well as the chemicals and water are pumped into 
these wells and into the cracks and the sand actually holds open the cracks so that the gas can uh, be released and be captured by the wells. Um, so that's kind of the, the role that frac sand mining plays or frac sand plays in the you know overall fracturing uh, overall fracking process, and this is just a um, a picture of some of the frac sand that is mined here in Wisconsin, the type of frac sand, and it just gives you a sense of what we're talking about. It is um, it's there's certain qualities of the sand here that um, the sand that the Fracking companies like to use that's sort of beneficial for the fracking process. It's very hard. It's relatively round, um, and so it's uh, got some properties that make you know make it a desirable type of sand to use. And we've had there were some discussions earlier today about um, there's other types of sand that are used for fracking, and um, there's some industry movement back possibly towards other types of sand. But this is the type of sand that's been in high demand in Wisconsin. Um, and then just a little bit more about the industry. You know, there's both, there's the mining, but there's also the processing that takes place in Wisconsin and, and typically very close by to the mining, if not at the same site. And there's also the transportation of the sand to the, you know, the end point, wherever they're gonna use it for fracturing. And all of these, each of these processes, the mining, the processing, and the transportation have impacts um, and have some you know, negative externa externalities associated with them. Um, but it, it's just important, you know, we refer to it as frac sand mining, but there are some other steps, the processing and the transportation that are, you know, when we talk about frac sand mining, we're talking about those things as well. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of potential environmental and public health impacts associated with frac sand mining. Um, I'll touch on a couple of them. With in, in terms of air quality, the, the major pollutants of concern there, there's, it, there's a lot of emissions of um, particulate matter and at varying sizes. And as you get into smaller sizes of the particulate matter, it's very, very fine dust. Uh, there's some health risks and health consequences associated with those. And so one of the pollutants that we have been focusing on in our work uh, with communities is particulate matter 2.5. I mean, it's it's very very tiny dust. It's not visible to uh, the naked eye. Uh, but as these facilities do emit this type of pollution, and uh, and it has been linked with certain diseases and other consequences. And you you know you hear from these communities, people that live nearby, that the, you know, of the different respiratory stresses that they that they're going through. Um, there's not. You know, it's a newer industry, so there's not, we haven't gotten to a point where we can link the emissions from these facilities to any, you know, um, concrete evidence of health impacts on a community-wide basis. But, uh, you know, at the on-the-ground level, you certainly hear from a lot of people who have had uh, difficulties after a frac sand mine has moved into their community. Uh, and in terms of water quality, there's a couple of different things that come up. Um, there's both quality and quantity issues. And so on the quality side of things, um, there, the frac sand mines um, collect their stormwater and, and their processed wastewater on site. And the, that water, for several years, sort of in the beginning of things, a lot of those ponds were leaking and overflowing. And there was a lot of um, negative impacts associated with that to some of our water resources. Um, as we've started to learn more about the industry, we've also started to see that there's a risk for high levels of metals in the stormwater and wastewater, and that has to do with the, um, the, the specific rock formations that are being um, that are being mined. There are some sulfides and some minerals in those rock formations, and when that those that when those minerals are exposed to air, it can create uh, acidic water and also very um, with high metal content which is commonly known as like the acid mine drainage um, we haven't sort of detected any acid mine drainage but we have seen the high levels of uh, metals and they're monitoring the pH in some of these uh, stormwater ponds in order to, to get on top of this and figure out what exactly is going on because no one 
at, at one point no one was even monitoring for the metal content in this water uh, and it was uh, it took several years to get the DNR to do anything on this so that's a you know sort of an emerging area of concern uh, related to frac sand mining uh, and then there's also on the on the quality on the quantity end you know these facilities use, use quite a bit of water the DNR estimates that most frac sand mines use between 300 and 3,000 gallons per minute of water when they're in through their processing and other activities on site like when they're in operation um, so in Wisconsin a big a big issue is our groundwater quantity because of, there's been a big uptick in the amount of water that agriculture is using, especially our groundwater, uh, but this industry also is playing uh, into that as well. I focus in my work a lot on the environmental issues, but um, I'm sure Pat and others that live in these areas could speak much better to some of the community problems uh, that we're seeing at the local scale in terms of quality of life, transportation, that sort of thing. Yep. How many miles or how many gallons per hour did you say? Uh, it was 300 to 3,000 gallons per minute when they're <laughs> in like at full operation. Per minute? Yeah. Oh, wow. Can, can you explain what they use the water for? I mean, that's astounding to me. Yeah, so uh, a lot of it has, like when they're processing it on site, there's just a lot of water involved in that. Uh, part of the process and there's also washing the different cars there's like all the little things that happen on site um, that contribute to their water use so there's uh, oh right and so there's also some dust control dust, I was about to say there's dust control oh, okay. and then also if they're the when they're dewatering the site which allows they dig deeper and there's groundwater if they're pulling the water out they factor that into okay. the 300 to 3,000 gallons per minute. Many of them have closed loop systems now where they are recycling the water. Okay. And, and then, then they have to, you know, take care of some of that water that's spent. Yeah. So. But they're not leaking as much as they did at the beginning, you said? Um, well, many of the mines haven't been operating lately. Oh. But yeah, we've had, we've had leakage, leakage in, into rivers and streams and all of that kind of thing. Because it seems like it'd be pretty impossible to capture all of that runoff. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, you know, there's, they have some very big <coughs> ponds. Uh, oh. and the ponds drain to the groundwater, um, so it captures, uh, captures a lot of the water that they're using. Um, well, Superior Silica had not been running. And they had so many of their ponds, wastewater and stormwater ponds, were filled right to the brim. Mm -hmm. So some of the farmers nearby thought it would be okay if they irrigated their crops with this water. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Typically before that, they were not allowing any of this water to be taken off this area. But now with new regulations, they can. So, yeah. so the farmers are using it to? Yes. Yikes. <laughs> nice. um, well, doesn't uh, make sense, but yeah. yeah. Just in terms of keeping an eye on time, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but you'll just see, I just wanted to kind of give you a sense. Others who have uh, given presentations on this today have talked about the same thing, but there's been a very quick and um, exponential growth in the number of frac sand mines in Wisconsin. I think, I can't remember the exact numbers, but uh, you know, there was in the order of 5, 10, 15 at one point, and now we're at like 169 or 129. 129. 129 sites. Not all of them are operational at this point, uh, but this kind of gives you a sense of where they are, and this is the <coughs> sand, like where the sand is located that um, they could potentially buy or that, that you know, has the type of sand that they're going after. Um, <coughs> So just, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, I want to just talk about a couple of the challenges that uh, folks have run into when they're working on this issue, both at the state and the local level. Um, so at the state level, because this was a new industry that came into Wisconsin when it first moved in, our regulations didn't adequately address the impacts of fracking and mining. Uh, the regulations that we did have in place were written for sand and gravel pits, which were much smaller scale, and they were written over 30 years ago at this point. Uh, so the state was sort of caught off guard, the DNR was caught off guard. The problem, though, is that those regulations still haven't changed 
you know, now nine, 10 years later, and we're operating under largely the same regulations that we know have been problematic for quite a, a long time at this point. One sort of anecdotal example is we have um, a, per, a permit that's issued by the Wisconsin DNR that um, authorizes stormwater and wastewater discharges from these facilities. And when the, the permit was written for the sand and gravel pits and it was highly problematic. And then we saw for several years, there was lots of just overflows and lots of leaks from these facilities into nearby wetlands and waterways in part because this permit really just didn't require the facilities to do the right things to address whatever was happening on their site. The DNR was in the press even saying this permit is inadequate, it doesn't work. And once it expired, they didn't issue a new one and kept issuing coverage under the expired permit that didn't work well to facilities for up to a year until some folks, we wrote a letter to the DNR just saying you can't do this legally, I and mean, they didn't have any legal basis to be continuing to issue this permit. Uh, and once that letter was written, they stopped issuing coverage under that permit, but it just took some action, and they, they knew it was wrong, and they knew it didn't work, and they just continued to let new facilities open, nonetheless, for, uh, for some time. So it's just things you have to kind of stay on top of with the state resource agency. Um, we also saw lax enforcement in Wisconsin, just across the board, we, our, our enforcement numbers are down over the last several years. Um, but especially with frac sand mining, a big piece of it at the beginning was the lack of staff, DNR staff resources to inspect and to document <coughs> any violations. And so we saw that what this sort of resulted in was uh, most of these problems were reported by citizens on the ground as they saw the different problems happening. When you see rivers like this. The facility didn't even know they were leaking stormwater and wastewater in these rivers. The DNR had no idea and it could you know, go on for however long until someone happened across this area and reported to, uh, to DNR. Um, and then there's also a lot of sort of these two things have to do with our natural resources agency but <coughs> with uh, our state legislature as well has been um, kind of a uh, a one-two punch. They are trying to strip local control and uh, because they say that it's more important and it works better across the board if there's state regulations that address the impacts. But they don't take the second step of actually trying to improve any of the state regulations to, um, uh, to where they need to be. So, you know, it's, it's, you can see right through what they're doing, but it's, um, we've, there was a, a bill proposed a year or two ago, I think two years ago at this point, that was defeated, um, but there's talks of that being reintroduced. Um, so you deal with both, you know, the agent, at the agency level and you have challenges in the legislature and the governor's office as well. Um, at the local level, um, you know, I don't know that I'm the best person to speak on these issues because I don't deal with the local government decision making on a day to day basis. <laughs> Folks like Pat might be able to do it better, but my sense of it is that it's been more of a mixed bag. And I think at the beginning there was quite a few challenges in working with local governments. Um, there are issues in terms of um, just having the proper procedures and processes in place. And a lot of these, a lot of the local towns and the counties and the villages weren't properly noticing meetings, they weren't keeping the proper records, and there, uh, and there was just a lot of issues with how the government function was working. And as more people started showing up to meetings and requesting information, I think that stuff started to get better. It's maybe not, you know, all perfect, but like I've seen, what I've seen is that that's, those things have started to get better. And those are important protections, those processes that they follow are really important protections uh, for the public. Um, so it's good to see that that's moved forward. Um, at the same time, you know, there's been allegations of conflicts of interest and self-dealing and that, uh, you know, so there's problems with that at the local level um, where you have uh, a town or county or village official who stands to gain from the the, the industry voting on these types of 
decisions related to the industry. Um, so it's been tough. And then I think it was just mentioned at a, an earlier presentation, but one thing that I just find it, it's hard for me to see, but there's these annexations where a particular town uh, will there's you know property in a town that the uh, frac sand mining wants to mine, and the town um, either has an ordinance in place for certain restrictions that they want to place on the mine, and the mine isn't happy with those. So what they do is they go to the nearby city who has the power under Wisconsin law to annex to basically make that part of the town part of their city, and then they. Uh, the mine agrees to pay a sort of a certain amount per ton of of sand mine to the city, so the city can make uh, some make some money off of this mine. But the problem with that is that the folks who live near the mine, who are part of the town, you know, aren't represented in the city government, and so the they're the ones suffering the impacts from that. But they have no outlet once they're once that property is annexed. Um, you know, the town has very little control over what happens at that point. And so what you'll see is you'll have the city, a very long strip of, narrow strip of land that's being annexed and then the mine itself. Um, and so it's very, you know, again, like the impacts, are, you know, aren't felt by the people who are being represented um, at the city. So there's different things that have happened um, that make it, you know, difficult and things that you run into. Um, so, but moving on to some of the challenges, I kind of just wanted to talk about different opportunities. Again, working within those government processes and government functions, uh, that we, the opportunities that we have to advocate. And so one that is pretty boring to talk about, but I think really, really important, is our open records and open meetings laws. And so all states, I'm like 99% sure all states have some sort of open records law. We also have the, the Federal uh, Freedom of Information Act. Those are really, really important tools that allow anyone to obtain government records. Uh, and records are typically defined very broadly. I mean, you can request uh, calendars of different government officials, notes that they took at the meetings. I mean, it's very, very broad. And there are some exceptions to what you can get and that varies from state to state, and it usually has to do with you know, public safety or certain types of information where it's you know, not in the public interest to release it, but by and large, there's a lot of information that you can get, and it's important to use these tools uh, to just be a check on what the government is doing and how these different process, uh, decisions are being made. And you can get emails, and it's unbelievable what people put in emails sometimes, but it's really important just to, just to check and to use these open records law. Um, and at the, you know, at the local level, there's lots for these types of sand mines. There's lots of decisions being made at the local level. Uh, and so for each of these decisions that are being made, there's a, a way for the public to participate in that process. And so typically there's requirements for public hearings and public comment. Uh, and there's, there's usually opportunities to appeal the decision of the, of the local government, uh, both you know, make an appeal to the government itself, uh, the local unit of the government, and then if they don't address your concern, you then can go into court as well. And so there's lots of opportunity for participation in these. Um, and there's, you know, it's, it's, as Pat can probably tell you, it's, it's not always easy, it's a lot of, you have to dig in, you have to um, you know, educate yourself on what the requirements are, what opportunities are available to you, but there are ways to participate, and they can, as I'll go through when I look at a couple of examples, you know, can really have an impact on, on the industry and what you're trying to do. Um, Where again, sort of where my expertise and focus is, is that more at the state level. Um, and you know, one thing I like to talk to people about is the opportunities that our federal environmental laws give to citizens to participate in the environmental permitting process. Uh, when when our federal environmental laws were passed, a lot, you know, mostly in the 70s, um, there 
was a recognition of the need for citizen participation in order for these environmental laws to really work. Um, so they guarantee citizens the right to comment and participate in the permitting, to challenge those permit the, the permitting decisions, and which and there's one other aspect which is really was at the time was very unique. It was the first sort of model in the world that allowed citizens to act as private attorney generals. So essentially, if there's a polluter that's violating one of these environmental statutes and the state isn't taking enforcement <coughs> action against them, then the, a citizen who's affected by that pollution can go <coughs> and bring a lawsuit in federal court against the polluter. Um, there's a lot of power behind that. The potential fines are very big. I think at this point, the statutory level for the fines is something over fifty thousand dollars per day per violation. Wow. If you prove a violation, um, you don't recover that money yourself. You're acting as like you know a representative of the state, and so that those fines get paid to the state. Wow. Um, but and you can recover attorneys' fees in those cases, so you you know you don't have to necessarily shoulder the financial burden, and the polluter might have to pay your attorneys' fees. It's a really powerful tool. Um, at the same time, there, it's difficult. You're bringing a, a, loss, a big lawsuit in federal court against uh, big, you know, sometimes a big money interest. So there's lots of challenges to those cases, but they're an important tool that are out there um, which can really have a lot of impact. Um, so just a couple of quick examples, and I'll turn it over to Tim. Uh, the, this is a case that recently came out of there was a decision from the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and I think, I think it's important because it shows the value of kind of what we were talking about at the local level, showing up to those meetings, uh, testifying at zoning decision meetings, and, and bringing your voice and having it heard. Um, what happened was the Trimble County Zoning Committee denied a permit, a conditional use permit, to All Energy Corporation for a frac sand mine. There was uh, several years of litigation. It finally made its way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court looked at several issues, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and they looked at several issues, but one of the arguments that All Energy had said was that the Trempolo County Zoning Committee uh, should not have relied on citizen testimony to deny the permit because it was uh, uncorroborated evidence. There were lay persons. They, they didn't have any expert uh, uh, expertise and so whatever they said at the meetings couldn't support the decision that uh, the zoning committee had made. And what the Supreme Court did was they looked at the this is the uh, zoning ordinance from Trumpolo County and they looked at the, the language of it. And they said that the zoning ordinance invites public testimony and uh, you know, explicitly, it says you have to have a public hearing. They invite anyone who's impacted to provide public testimony. And then they have these different uh, criteria by which the zoning committee has to make their decision. They said, looked at these criteria and said that the public and the people who are impacted by these sand mines have a unique perspective that can uh, weigh in on these criteria about the different impacts that may. Um, uh, may influence you know one of the criteria one, one way or the other. And so they rejected all energy's arguments and said that uh -huh. the courts would be remiss and the county itself would be remiss not to listen to the citizens who are impacted by these mines. Uh -huh. They found that the citizen testimony um, established substantial evidence to support the zoning committee's decision. And I was really surprised to see this because the Wisconsin Supreme Court has not been very, hasn't, been there haven't been a lot of wins coming out of it lately, uh, but this I think was just a really powerful affirmation of the importance of showing up to those meetings and making sure that your perspective is being heard and making that part of the record. Um, and just the last thing I'll say on that is uh, the latest out of the legislature is that there's a the new bill that they're gonna proposed to limit local control uh, could have some language in it that would essentially negate what the Wisconsin Supreme Court said here. Mm -hmm. So that it would mandate that a county cannot, uh, uh, or a local unit of government, cannot rely on citizen 
testimony in and of itself in order to support a land use decision. Uh -huh. um, it has to be some sort of corroborating testimony. From, uh, so we'll see, you know, sort of one thing after another. Um, you know, you, you have to keep at it, but there are these sort of ways that you can get involved and the ways that, that you can have an impact. Um, but again, thinking in broader terms, this is one advocacy tool out of a whole toolbox of them, uh, but it's one that I, I personally think you can't forget, and you, know, you got to participate. So, I I had one additional slide I was going to talk about, but just looking at the time, I think I'm going to turn it over to, to Tim. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah. Take a little computer switch here. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, when we introduced ourselves. At the beginning of the presentation, I, I mentioned that I wear several hats. I've been involved in the conservation realm and the legal realm. Uh, one of the hats that I forgot to mention, which is relevant to my presentation today, is also a, a filmmaker hat. Um, and that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about, is how things like film can be used to address some of the issues uh, of concern. And. Uh, uh, hopefully this will work. You have to use that little screen and pull oh, out what you yes. want. Oh, okay. I see we have to hit mini display port. Yay. So, <laughs> nice picture. All right. Yeah, so this is near uh, about a mile from where I currently live. Um, process of moving, but there's a lot of beautiful areas uh, around here. So, um, I'm going to talk about kind of two things. One is uh, the legal approach to dealing with these nasty impacts to our landscape, like Frank San Lanning. And then I'm going to talk about how we can use communication tools to try to reach the hearts and minds of people. Um, so basically, talking about you know using both the, the carrot and the stick. Because I think if we want to be effective, we can't just always use the stick. Um, there are a lot of, you know, means we have to to work to bring about change. And Jimmy talked about, for example, citizens being active and going, showing up to town board meetings and taking a stand, and that's incredibly important. And of course, I'm a lawyer, a trial lawyer, and I'm involved in lawsuits where we're suing the frac sand companies to try to uh, prevent the harm that's happening. Uh, but we also need to sometimes think about how the people who are often making the decisions about whether to allow a certain land use to take place uh, can sometimes be persuaded to think in different ways. And usually the best way to persuade somebody is not to be hitting them over the head. <laughs> you know, if, if you hit them hard enough, you'll knock them down. But if you just hit them and keep hitting them, you just annoy them, and then they're going to react against you rather than work with you. And so. I'm going to talk about those different approaches today. So I know some of you are not from this area. We have a representative from the great state of Texas here, for example. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, this region we're talking about for frac sand mining. So where are we? We're in what's called the Griffiths region. During the last ice age, the glaciers covered much of North America. And for various reasons, they left this little area untouched throughout about a million and a half years or two million years, there were all these different glacial advances and retreats, and the glaciers came down, and they mowed down the landscape and leveled it, but they kept missing this one area, which we refer to as the Driftless Area. And there's just another view of that with the, the Laurentian uh, ice sheet that came down, or the warm tide ice sheet that came down and left an area untouched. And so why should we care about that? Well, it's because this is the result of the, the lack of glaciation. We have a very ancient landscape in the Driftless region. I wish this is a picture taken uh, right near or just across the Mississippi River from La Crosse. It's kind of too bad we don't have the conference taking place there uh, so you could more fully appreciate the landscape in which this frac sand mine is taking place. But it is just an incredible area. It's a great place to be outdoors recreating. You know, we've got beautiful ancient rivers. We are the only place in the world that has ancient effigy mounds that were created by Native Americans about a thousand years ago. Um, and in the form of various animals or spirits. Uh, so there were bear mounds and falcon effigies and 
serpent mounds and things like that, uh, just really remarkable. We have world-class crystal clear trout streams in the Griffiths. We have some of the best trout fishing anywhere on the planet mm -hmm. in the Griffiths. Uh, it's just an incredible, beautiful area. And so why is the frac sand mine in here? Why in this place? Well, again, as Jimmy mentioned, it's the geology. So we have this, these sand formations, and it's not, it's not loose sand. This is sandstone, but it just so happens that it has grains within that that are great for uh, doing fracking. And you'll see, so here's the region of where the sandstone is. And this is where the Driftless region of Wisconsin is. Of course, the Driftless region also covers parts of neighboring states, but mostly is in Wisconsin. And it's just kind of an interesting coincidence that there's so much correlation between uh, where those two are. And you can see here that because it's this ancient landscape that wasn't mowed down by the glaciers, it's really rugged, rugged topography. It has this dendritic pattern to the landscape uh, dendritic meaning, you know, like tree-like or root-like, uh, the way that these valleys have eroded deeply, and that exposes these uh, these sand layers uh, that are easily mined. And so, you know, there's a difference between the sand that people can get in the driftless region versus what people typically see for sand. If they want these round, beautiful white grains of sand because they're hard and they're round and they prop open those cracks in the ground really well. And so we, we are the best, unfortunately, we're the best place in the world for a lot of things, including our frac sand. Wow. And so, uh, you know, here's just some images of the mines. They just level the, the beautiful bluffs around here to create these mining facilities. Yeah, disgusting. Um, so that's what we're talking about. And we have a lot of small communities in the Driftless area that are struggling. And so, you know, the mining companies come in and say, we're going to bring you a lot of jobs. And uh, some folks are really susceptible to those arguments. Um, some of the poorest, the uh, most impoverished uh, counties in Wisconsin are located in this Driftless area. Some of them in particular, like Jackson County, uh, you know, dealing with mining issues. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about some legal tools that we have to address that. There are a number of approaches we can take to fight frac sand mining. I'm involved, and I, I apologize that Tom Wister uh, could not be here. He's a, ret a retired judge and a trial lawyer, and he has been working tirelessly on pursuing claims against frac sand mining companies uh, and others who are involved in exploiting the, re the natural resource we have and, and severely damaging our landscape and ruining our communities. Uh, he couldn't be here today, um, but I'm going to talk about a number of these tools. So. Anticipatory nuisance, compensatory nuisance, conflicts of interest that with lawyers involved in the frac sand mining industry, legal malpractice issues, open meetings violations that Jimmy talked about, and offensive industry ordinances. So nuisance claims. Um, and like I said, there's a couple different flavors of that. There's anticipatory nuisance, and then there's these compensatory nuisance claims. So what, are, what is the nuisance? So frac sand mines, you know, create all sorts of issues for our communities. It, it creates pollution. It, it, for people who live next to these mines, it is a nightmare. It is like living in hell. These people have bright lights on 24 hours a day. They've got huge amounts of noise. They're breathing silica dust. I mean, if you worked in a business that had silica dust like that, I mean, OSHA wouldn't allow it because you'll get silicosis. But if you happen to be on a farm or a home next to one of these mines, Guess what? OSHA doesn't come in, they don't regulate it. So you're exposed to that, that sort of particulate matter. Um, they're blasting, they're dynamiting, they're running hundreds if not thousands of trucks down the roads, ruining the roads, ruining the quality of life, taking these beautiful quiet areas and turning them into industrial hell zones. And so it's a terrible nuisance and we do have some legal tools to address that. Anticipatory nuisance is when we're trying to stop the harm from occurring in the first place. And unfortunately, uh, there hasn't been enough effort to try to stop these things. We already have 129, is it 126, whatever the number of processing and mining facilities is in Wisconsin, a huge number. We now have a couple of pending lawsuits representing a number of property owners around mines. Uh, we've asserted that, or around, I'm sorry, so 
a couple lawsuits where there are planned mines, where the mines have not gone in yet. Uh, one of those lawsuits is, is Kruger versus All Energy. And the case has been pending for about a year and a half. And unfortunately, we got a negative decision from the trial court uh, just last week. Or was it this week? I, guess it was, I think it was last week. I can't even remember what day it was. But um, the trial court fortunately did say, and this is a from the court's ruling, as a general rule, the courts will intervene only to enjoin an actual and existing nuisance. Huh. However, Wisconsin permits the courts to intervene in a threatened or anticipated nuisance when the prospective nuisance is inevitable and undoubted. And so this is the first time a Wisconsin court has actually made any ruling. We have what's called a case of first impression where we're, we're plowing new ground, in, so to speak, in terms of the, the legal theory we're using to stop these horrible abominations in the landscape from occurring. And we have a situation where the mining company filed a motion to dismiss saying, hey, look, we're going to put this mine in. There's all these regulations. We've got to get all these permits. Um, you know, you, we're doing all sorts of good things. There's an ordinance that governs non-metallic mining. We've entered into a development agreement with the local municipality, the local town. The town says it's okay. I mean, they met with us. We negotiated a contract. The contract has all sorts of requirements. So why should you stop us? We're not going to create a nuisance because the development agreement says we're not going to and then has penalties if we somehow violate that. So. That's the defense of the mining company. <coughs> and what the court unfortunately sided with the mining company further down, the, although the court said that Wisconsin law does permit such a claim, they said, well, in this case, the town was supportive of the mine. The town evaluated the risk to their citizens. The town had an ordinance regulating non-metallic mining. The town entered into a development agreement and that is the step taken to protect the citizens. And so the court felt like they couldn't come in and overturn the decision of the local municipality, that they, the court was deferring to the local yeah, here, here. government entity as to whether the citizens would be adequately protected. You know, that's where we get back to what Jimmy was talking about, about the importance of citizens getting engaged in local government and stopping these things from happening. So we have situ other situations. I was at a town board meeting in another town uh, a couple nights ago where they just passed some new ordinances, and we'll talk about the offensive industry ordinances, um, where it'll be a very different situation. If we f end up filing an anticipatory nuisance mm -hmm. case there, we won't have a situation where the court will say, well, the local township, the local government has already said it's OK. They've already put protections in place to protect their citizens. So we have this situation where we have some favorable law helping us out, but we also have some pretty big hurdles to deal with when we have bad government and where people aren't participating in the local government and making sure that homeowners are protected from these threats. Um, so I guess the book has not, we're not to the last chapter in that book yet. It's still, we're still, that's moving forward. Uh, there are a lot of issues with regard to the lawyers that are representing the Fraxen mining companies. It is a terrible situation. There's a couple of law firms in particular that are representing, and one especially, that is, has for a long time represented the local municipalities in western Wisconsin. So they represent counties, they represent townships, uh, they represent villages. And so when this, this whole mining phenomenon, frac sand mining phenomenon, happened suddenly and unexpectedly in southwestern Wisconsin. Nobody, I mean, seven, eight years ago, I'm not sure exactly what, when that was, that suddenly we started hearing about these mines popping up. And it was, it was a very sudden and unexpected thing. And townships and villages and counties were caught off guard. And they were not sophisticated. They did not expect to deal with this. They had had, you know, gravel mining, gravel quarries going on for decades, for more than a century, and that, which is very low, you know, low scale, small scale, you know, relatively low impact compared to what's going on now. And they were not equipped to deal with this. And so then you have these, this law firm in particular, <laughs> representing these communities, and then the mining companies come, and guess what? 
the law firm made sure that they were getting money from the mining companies to promote this because suddenly these big companies are coming in and they needed local representation. Oh. Well, the, the law firm was still representing the municipality <clears throat> at the same time it was representing the mining companies. Oh working both sides of it. There, we actually have one municipality in particular where um, the, this law firm was representing the town and there was this mine that was going to be proposed to be put right near the town and there were concerns and objections to it and the, the town board chairman said to the lawyer, well, aren't you, as they were discussing what to do, he said, well, isn't your firm representing that mining company? And he said, well, yeah, but how about I just keep representing the mining company and I'll have another lawyer from my firm represent the town. Hi, do you recall the name of that town? Yes, Milston. In Wisconsin? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, he said, yeah, we'll just have somebody else from my law firm represent you guys while I continue to represent the mining company. So you have these very blatant uh, conflicts of interest, <clears throat> um, which has led a lot of municipalities down the path of allowing mines to go in, of having these development agreements that they think are being put in place to protect the citizens so they can bring in jobs and, and have a more prosperous community, but in fact, you know, their interests, the residents' interests in those municipalities was not being represented because the lawyers were getting money from the mining companies while these negotiations were happening. So we believe that there are good and valid claims for legal malpractice that could be made in these instances. And so that is being evaluated and explored. Uh, in situations where one, a law firm is representing the mining company while at the same time representing the municipality. And I wish Tom Lister was here because he's had uh, so much more direct involvement with a number of these situations. He can tell you some really good war stories about mm -hmm. it. Um, and then the open meeting violations, Jimmy already talked about that, but there's been some really blatant examples, uh, open meeting violations and uh, so there's, there's a host of tools we have in terms of you know, using the law to try to tamp down what's been going on. I mean, we can't completely stop what's happened. There's you know, more than 100 of these facilities already in place uh, in, in western Wisconsin, but we think that we can make a real difference in terms of you know, minimizing the number of additional facilities that goes in you know, try and get compensation for local residents who are enduring these horrible conditions living next to mines. And uh, so I guess I'm going to move on from the, the legal end of things unless anybody has any questions about that part of it. But I really think the nuisance claims are going to be a huge issue, especially the comp compensatory nuisance claims where the mines are already in place and where the residents have been subjected to these horrible conditions for a lengthy period of time. So a quick question about that. What kind of, for residents to get involved in an action like that, it would probably require substantial resources, right? To hire a lawyer, to engage in the... Well, um, developing a lawsuit? The, uh, I mean, right now, the, the law firm of Fitzpatrick Skemp and Associates is representing uh, groups of individual property owners. Now, for the in, in different ways depending upon the circumstances. So if there's an actual compensable nuisance, so if the mine's in place already and these people are already suffering as a result of that, um, the firm is representing those landowners uh, on a contingent fee basis. Uh, and then there are various people who are helping support the expenses of that litigation. We have some contributors that are supporting that through you know charitable giving to <laughs> to help make it possible to fund uh, what can be very expensive litigation. Um, we have some individuals who have chosen to spend money out of their own pocket to try to prevent mines from coming in because they know that their, pro I mean, their lives are gonna be in bad shape, the environment's gonna be devastated, and so there's a lot at stake here. So, but yeah, it can be an expensive thing for, for people to undertake. Um, and hopefully through things like contingent fee agreements, we can help folks in situations where they have been harmed and try to get some compensation from the mining companies for that. Does that answer? 
Do the, are these um, cases that can be brought up with the state attorney general's office in terms of public protection bureaus and that sort of thing that would would not require substantial resources because perhaps that state's attorney general would fall in the purview of their jurisdiction? Well, we have a situation in Wisconsin, at least, and I'm, I'm from Wisconsin, so I can't speak to neighboring states, but almost all the facilities are in Wisconsin. I don't know. How many are across the river? Anybody know? There's several, but not but it's, but it's, it's a tiny fraction compared to Wisconsin. Wisconsin has an administration right now that's very pro-industry and very pro-mining. <laughs> Uh, Governor Walker and his administration, I mean, the, the slogan for Wisconsin is open for business. Mm -hmm. And so there is zero interest. They completely, they're in the process of completely gutting our Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin. They've slashed funding and staff for the, the people who do science and who analyze threats to our environment are, are being cut out, <coughs> eliminated, downsized. Um, and you know their their hands the the hands of the people the field staff who would normally be working to protect the environment are being you know held behind their backs by the the political appointees at the top. Sounds like so Texas. asking uh, the state government to get involved is is uh, pretty tough. And sure. it, you I don't think you were here for Jimmy's presentation, but he talked about. Midwest Environmental Advocates, which is a public interest law firm, so that's another avenue for addressing some of these wrongs, is we have Midwest Environmental Advocates in Wisconsin working to fight frac sand mining, and that entity is actually the outflow of the fact that Wisconsin used to have a public intervener, which was basically a lawyer that was there as a watchdog over, and Jimmy can talk about, and did talk about that uh, much more effectively earlier, but we used to have a public intervener's office that would look out for the interests of our natural environment in Wisconsin. That ended up going away, and then as a result, Midwest Environmental Advocates was born to kind of fill that void. So, you know, it's wonderful that we've got MEA doing their legal part, um, and so they're working with citizen groups and tribes and others to try to address frac sand mining, and then there are private attorneys who are also working to oppose those activities. Thanks. Um, so, I want to go beyond, oh, offensive industry ordinances. So, I mentioned there was this, this town um, that had that conversation with the lawyer where the lawyer said, well, I'm representing the Frank Sand Mine Company, but I'll have somebody else from my office represent you, the, the municipality. Um, so that town actually has now passed a couple of new ordinances. Just mere days ago, they passed two new ordinances, one that regulates noise, and another one that regulates diesel emissions. They're a small municipality. Um, they're a, a town that has adopted village powers. And so under Wisconsin statutes, uh, either a village or a town that has adopted village powers can pass ordinances that uh, limit or restrict offensive industries. And they have done that because the town can't say we're prohibiting mining. As, and in this case, the mine is located, uh, let me correct that. So this is a case where there's a town and the mine is actually being located in a different neighboring municipality, but all the trucks from the mine are gonna be directed through the population center of this town. And uh, so they actually passed an ordinance earlier this summer that they got sued by the mining company for, and the mining company said, no, you know, you've, you've, gone, you've overstepped the bounds and you've gone too far and you're clearly just trying to, you're targeting us and, mm -hmm. and not anybody else. And uh, they now try to, they're trying a different approach, which is the noise ordinance and the diesel emissions ordinance, because they're gonna have, I think it's 576 trucks filled with frac sand coming through, rumbling through the town every day. And this is a, you know, 24 hour a day thing. So. And then there's railroad tracks there, railroad crossing, a lot of trains. So they're gonna they're gonna stop and they're gonna be backed up. So the town is basically gonna end up getting filled with backed up frac sand trucks day after day after day. People are the whole quality of life is gonna diminish. And what is the name of the town? The town of Milston, Milston. in Jackson County. And so they uh, have taken a, a leadership position by passing these new ordinances. We strongly suspect they may get sued by the mining company again. 
<laughs> so we'll see what happens. Um, but it's something you know we're encouraging other municipalities to do. So again, even though the mine's not located directly within their municipality, there are regulatory tools, legal tools they have to limit what happens in their town. And interestingly, the, the reason, so these trucks are coming through this population center, it's not a big population center, but to them it's important, that's their homes. Uh, but the trucks are routed through there, and that's because the municipality that allowed the mine to go in said, well, you can put the mine here, but you can't, you can't drive through our population center. We want you to take this other county road through the neighboring municipality. And, and so as long as you do that, you can put your mine in. So they dump their problem of all this truck traffic and all the dust, you know, the silica dust from that truck traffic and all the noise and all the congestion on this neighboring municipality. So Why I, don't I think- they get together? Huh? They ought to get together. They ought to, yeah. But you've got people with different perspectives on, on mining. So um, anyway, so I also want to talk about, you know, are there other approaches to addressing problems like Praxian mining other than legal and political tools? So I want to talk for a moment about the, the carrot versus the stick approach or honey instead of vinegar, uh, because I really do think that's an important thing, an important consideration that we can change people's hearts and minds about this beautiful area in which this mining is taking place. And I think we need to do a combination of getting people out in nature and exposed to these beautiful landscapes uh, and also use uh, modern tools, uh, video production and uh, photography to get people to appreciate how incredible and beautiful the area is. It's a beautiful and fun place to be outdoors and this isn't something that we should just, you know, run over with mining equipment. Um, I mentioned that I'm a filmmaker, so I've made a film, uh, I was an executive producer of a film about three years ago called Mysteries of the Driftless. It's uh, a documentary short, a half hour long film that was broadcast on PBS. And uh, I think that was a great example of a way where we weren't trying to beat people over the head about, oh, you're doing bad things, but rather to just try to get people to realize this is such an amazing area where this frac sand mining is taking place and have a greater respect. I know I have heard of situations in which municipalities, town boards, for example, are consider or county boards considering things like frac sand mining moratoriums where you have people on the, the town or the county board who are not environmentalists. And if you say you're an environmentalist, they'll want to tar and feather you. You know, that if you're an environmentalist, you're one of those horrible tree huggers and you're killing jobs and we don't want you around here. Those sorts of folks, those people with those attitudes, you're not gonna get them to, to work in your favor if you're beating them over the head and you're saying you're bad and you're doing bad things to our community. But I think you can, you can of course, you can try to get them unelected. That's one approach <laughs> and a good approach. So if you've got people like that on your municipal boards, you probably want to try to boot them off. But in the meantime, while they're there and in positions of power to enter into these development agreements with mining companies, maybe try a different approach. And that is to celebrate the landscape because we know of instances where these anti-environmentalist folks, who all they care about is jobs and money, when they've seen our film, Mysteries of the Driftless, they said, I didn't realize I lived in such a special place. I've been here for 65 years or whatever, oh, and wow. I never knew how special this was. And so I think we need to get people out. I'm gonna show you just a brief uh, trailer for the first and I'm a biologist and I'm a filmmaker and I have a single question for you well two do you know what the driftless zone is and do you know how important it really is <laughs> in this one small region of our country lies an area that wasn't hit by the crushing effects of the glaciers it created a kind of topographical island and it created a unique home for some very rare species 
like the Pleistocene snails. This is an island within the island of the Driftless area. Rare snakes. So this guy is lurking somewhere in here, and I hope I don't step on him. Rare plants. They're holdovers from another time. It was the home of ancient cultures who have now left their mark, and it's almost been forgotten. I think we're seeing about 10% of the rock gardens here. It's the location of one of the oldest rivers in the world. There are caves, sinkholes, and some world-class, super clear trout streams. But, as it turns out, many of the people that live there don't know what a special spot they're actually living in. What, the yeah. Driftless Zone? What, what is the Driftless Zone? The Driftless Area. Maybe, maybe I said it wrong. I'm not sure what that is. That sounds like a desert or something. So basically, myself and my friend Amber Tallon have teamed up with the Mississippi Valley Conservancy and the area's leading scientists because we want to make sure that every single person that lives in the Driftless Area knows exactly how unique it really is. There is hardly a property in the Driftless Area that does not have a rare species on it. And most people don't know that. And it's all it takes is a hike through your property, get familiar with the species that are there, and know that once a property turns to pavement, if it's developed or mined, you can't get that back. You can't restore it to what it was. It's much better to protect what you have. So if you're like us, and you're a big fan of the Driftless Area, at the very least, you can help us by just spreading the word about what we're doing, because it's going to be pretty amazing. Okay, I will see you at one of the screenings. So if you haven't yet seen Mysteries of the Driftless, I hope you'll check it out. Um, like I said, it's a short film. You can find it on YouTube. Just search for Mysteries of the Driftless. Um, and I'm working on a new film now um, called Decoding the Driftless. It'll be a feature-length documentary, again, featuring the, the beautiful area. We did, I was thrilled that we won an Emmy Award for the first Great. film. Great. And so I would encourage you to use tools like that. I know people who go around and they show it to different groups and get people excited about the beautiful landscape. We do film screenings all the time. Uh, for it, and it's just a, a great way to get a kind of a positive feeling about this beautiful area that uh, all this horrible fraction mining is taking in. So get, we need to get people out and get them connected with nature, and we're really thrilled that you know the film has had the reach and impact that it had. This is our um, Secretary of Tourism, Wisconsin, former host of the Discover Wisconsin TV program, commenting on the film. Uh, uh, Rick Kite is a professor at the Turbo University in La Crosse. He he's, uh, teaches ethics, among other things. And he said, I found no better way of engaging students in a discussion of environmental responsibility than showing the film Mysteries of the Driftless. Um, so he says, you know, it's films like this that get young people excited and engaged. That he's been showing, you know, he's been giving lectures and showing people different films. And, you know, if we want to get people excited and we want to get them to care, uh, we have to introduce them to what's special about the landscape. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip over this stuff. So anyway, um, I just think that this is a really neat tool. I'm gonna just show you part of the trailer for the new film coming up, and then I'll let you guys go. <laughs> In the middle of North America exists a mysterious land left untouched for millions of years by massive continental glaciers of the last ice age. This is the Driftless, a rugged landscape home to tremendous biodiversity, fascinating geology, and features unique in the world. If you grew up here, you may know this is a special place where you can marvel at freshwater flowing and daydream about adventures. But as nice as it is, most people don't realize how rare and fragile the Driftless is. It contains the world's oldest river, ancient effigy mounds, deep caves, hidden waterfalls, fossils from ancient seas, and a migratory corridor of global importance. And if people are unaware of what an amazing place this is, it could be lost forever. I'm Rob Nelson, and I love the Driftless area, as I'm sure all of you that are watching do as well. My wife Haley, my friend Jonas, and his fiance Louise, and I from Untamed Science have joined up with George and Tim from Sustainable Driftless, along with other amazing filmmakers, educators, scientists, and local stewards, to make a feature-length film. Our creative team will take you on a journey that you will never forget. So join us as we explore the amazing Driftless and reveal her many secrets. You see, we've learned that once people know how special this place is, they will want to experience it, share it, and conserve it. And for me, I also want to make sure this place is taken care of for my kids to enjoy as I have. We want to decode the Driftless for you, your family, your friends, and future generations. Yeah. From 
in the air here, you can really see these sinkholes. They're just all over the landscape. We've already spent a lot of time crafting the message. In fact, we won an Emmy for our initial efforts. And Emmy goes to Mysteries of the Driftless, Untamed Science. That was a fantastic honor, and we want to use that momentum to create something that will last a lifetime. So here's how you can help. It's easy. We need to go send you a pitch for funding, which I'll spare you from. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, uh, any last questions? That's a great tool. Yeah. Um, Jimmy, is it uh, mentioned or alluded to the problem of preemption? You know, where you have state regulations, so the lo local government is powerless to, to intervene, and this is a big problem for us in Illinois. Um, I'm just wondering, I don't want to sidetrack this or anything, but have you guys heard of this uh, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund and their approach? And I'm wondering if you have an opinion about that. Uh, we, I have definitely mixed feelings about yeah. them, but, uh, yes. but I'm wondering if you've had any experience with them. I, I am uh, uh, I'm familiar with the organization and their, their effort. I don't know the details of it, so I'm, you know, I don't know that I can weigh in on it, but um, from what I've heard from folks on the ground, there are a lot of mixed feelings about whether it would be effective. I don't know if you or Pat, just for everyone else to say, could describe what it is. I, I'm just not, I, I feel like I'm not familiar with it. To, well, well th these uh, attorneys are from Pennsylvania. <clears throat> yeah. They're really trying to change the Constitution, I think, and using, probably using, uh, this, because this is a major issue, right. hydraulic fracturing is too. Some of the hydraulic fracturing issues are, have arisen in Pennsylvania, and therefore now they're engaged in Pennsylvania where they can legally, they can't, they can't come to Wisconsin because they're not licensed here. Sure. And there are very few attorneys who are willing to, to I mean, what they do is they develop ordinances that are illegal. Right, basically, the, the idea being that they believe that they can kind of create a legal revolution through the court right, system. Right, and so then there's a lawsuit that comes in, and people have to pay for it and all that yeah. kind of thing. Now, I know that the attorneys, the attorneys in Seldeck are being um, sued right now. Oh, they are? Oh, right. see, that's good. All right, well, I didn't mean to sidetrack that, but yeah, I, I, I mean, was I think just you. But I think it's, it's like, uh, it's kind of what I've talked about earlier in terms of the, the bigger box of advocacy tools, I mean, there's different ways and different um, things that folks can do to sort of try to create this progress. And that's one uh, particular tool that some communities are using. Um, I'm not as familiar with what uh, we're fo focused for. I think that, that where, what I talked a lot about was using the processes that the government has set out for us right. to participate. Yeah. Their approach is a little different. It's like challenging those government processes and like working outside of what is available to you right now and try to uh, create progress that way. And they may find some success there. I, I have very, just what little I can add, I, have, I haven't spent much time looking into that. I've heard about it over the last couple of years and I just, quite frankly, from what I've seen, I'm incredibly skeptical. Okay, we're on um, the same page then. <laughs> and it, it feels to me, I know some folks, for example, who, who try to argue that they don't have to pay income taxes because they think it's constitutionally impermissible oh, and yeah. they start yeah. protesting and then they, they do funky things like they change their their middle initial on their tax forms or something or whatever and then they say the government or they, or they spell their name or use capitals rather than lowercase letters and somehow think that's going to allow them to exempt themselves from federal income taxation. I. I don't know that they're the same thing but I tend to I don't to think they like are but they're... I'm, I'm kind of like it seems to be kind of a similar thought process yeah. where you think you can kind of skate around uh, the legal I, realm. I'd um, like to just to comment on that. So I'm not, I'm not involved with Sell That at all or the community rights movement, but um, having read a little bit about it, one of the things that is very interesting is they, um, one of the things they're focused on is the idea that corporations have rights, this whole notion of corporate personhood. So that, you know, that's a, a principle that has gained a lot of momentum in recent years and decades um, with things like, what's that, that, that Supreme Court decision? Citizens that, United. Citizens United, right, right. right that, that corporations are people and that if you ban this activity, you're violating their constitutional rights. So they're, they're criticizing the idea that a corporate entity has the same constitutional rights as a person. 
Well, well they're coming out with the idea that communities have rights. So that's the premise. That's so, part of their. You know, right. why doesn't a community have the right to ban a harmful industrial activity? Right. right? So they, they're, it's, they're kind of, it's a, crit a critique of the whole notion of corporate rights. It's, it's reframing the discussion. And for me, that's where the, like, the promise lies. And in Western Wisconsin, there have been some groups that have engaged in the discussion um, of the community rights movement. Um, and that's helped people to kind of think about how frac sand mining is a manifestation of the, the growth of corporate power in the United States. And to and see this not as a single issue, but as you know, as a symptom of a larger problem. Sure. Yeah. Some of the key uh, cell death uh, ordinances that have been passed have then been challenged. For example, the uh, no fracking ordinance, I think, in Boulder, Colorado, was challenged, and the state came in and said, the "Local community doesn't have authority to regulate because the state only the state has authority over mining and resources and whatnot." So there are other effort in this is to really show people where authority lies and that the communities don't have much authority at all. So right. this whole process of rallying around, getting an ordinance on the ballot, getting the ordinance approved, all of this is really a political education, uh, practical education in um, policy and, uh, um, and as you're saying, corporate rights versus community rights. So and part of, part of the, the litigation that they sometimes invite is to force corporations to assert that they have more rights than people, to kind of make that argument, to right. try to expose that. They, you know, so they, they kind of invite some of the litigation as a way to, to air out, you know, yeah. like defend yeah. that. You know, so how is that a bad but thing? If that you seems like a good thing to make them well, except that, except that we already know preemption exists, and why would you go through all the trouble right. of organizing to pass an ordinance that you know is going to be defeated in court because simply to illustrate something you already knew? So just to play yeah. devil's advocate, yeah. have the conventional mechanism worked? Well, no, but, but that means... So that, that, but that, the, that, the, the same... The results matter is what you're saying. The What's results that? matter. The right, right, matter. and and <laughs> the same amount of organizing into saying getting better people elected who yeah, can yeah. Oh. change the regulations yeah. or revoke them, you know, and that's think, that's where the. I think sold up. They they kind of view this as that that is an important component as well. As you're working from the ground up to kind of rewrite yeah. the, the rules of the game because all of the, these tools which are very important. You know, we still have a hundred something frac sand operations in Western Wisconsin. We still have tens of thousands of you know of <coughs> fracking wells across the country. I mean, it's we're losing this battle, right? So, do we keep on that that treadmill of fighting the same battles and maybe making some gains, but in the long run, we continue to to lose, or do we? We shift the terms of discussion, and this would be sell us. Right, right. I understand. So that, that's why I said it's mixed. Just, yeah, <laughs> it has to be thought just, from every angle. Yeah. Let me just give a quick example. So uh, the organization I co-chair, the Alliance for Democracy, has done a lot of sell up work. But and we just finished a big project in Maine, where the Maine farmers did not want to have to have certified kitchens. The, lo the small local farmers, they did not want to have to have small certified kitchens for uh, slaughter or for products that they're selling at the farmers markets. And so the state uh, FDA and the federal FDA were going to be requiring this. So these farmers were searching around, well, how do we sort of assert our rights as farmers over the requirements of government? And they, CELDEF was working with them and whatnot, but CELDEF wanted to refrain in this kind of corporate rights versus community rights battle of the giants. And these local farmers said, well, some of us are small nonprofits or we're small cor family corporations, and uh, we don't want to get into the, uh, in, into the argument of the type of entity, and uh, Seldef walked away very angry from that uh, discussion and said, you know, you do it, you write your ordinance this way in a community versus corporations way. So these farmers decided not to do that. They've gotten more than 24 ordinances passed in town meetings, and they were so impactful that the state legislature has now passed a law that confirms what they were saying is that they do not need certified kitchens, they do not need certified uh, slaughtering, because 
What they're emphasizing is that we are building trust between the farmer and the uh, consumer across the table. And if our product makes them sick, they won't come back to our table. So we, of course, are producing good food, you know, and, and good, good meat. And so that's sort of how it played out with Celdef at that point, that um, they, they walked away and said, if you're not going to write this ordinance the way we want you to write it so that you can fight this, this uh, theoretical as well as practical battle, we won't help you. So the farmers went ahead and this is what they've accomplished. They've gotten then the state legislature to write a bill and pass a bill that confirms their policy. Interesting. So when I, when I think about like what Seldon is doing in like Western Wisconsin, I mean, I, I think I agree. It's a good characterization. It's like challenging the rules of the game and trying to change the rules of the game, and you're going to have a lot of differences in opinion on whether that's a good idea. Right. And so right. I think yeah. they, right. they know that's the way it's going to happen sure. when they go into communities. Right. Some people might agree. Some people might not. Um, and then you know, I think a lot of what worries people is that. When you try and change the rule of game of the game, you invite litigation, which can be expensive for communities. And so, when you have people disagreeing on the sort of whether it makes sense to move forward in this way, those people who don't want to move forward in that way, their municipality may still have to foot the bill of the litigation, uh, which I think can be controversial for people. But I, I, I think again, like you know, you need to look at the wide array of advocacy tools that are available to you. Right. Um, it doesn't mean you have to support every way that people do it, but um, there's lots of different ways that you can do it. And some counties are keeping are keeping these frag sand mining companies out by writing more restrictive ordinances and zoning. Yeah. 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 And, and, and the companies don't come in. 